welcome. Welcome to Mental Health in the Mountains. We've got folks that are starting to roll in. We're gonna get started in about two minutes. All right, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to Mount Mental Health in the Mountains. Well, it looks like we've got a handful of folks with us on this webinar. This is Live Through This, A Lifetime with Suicidal Thoughts and Art as Social Justice with Desiree Stage. I'm Shannon Decker. I'm the Suicide Prevention Coordinator for the Tahoe Truckee Suicide Prevention Coalition. Uh, we are housed at Sierra Community House. This month is Suicide Prevention and Recovery Month. Our theme is Hope, Resilience, and Recovery. The town of Truckee uh, hosted a proclamation earlier in the month um, declaring it Suicide Prevention and Recovery Month and listing out a lot of different activities that are going on in our community, including this speaking series. Suicide prevention is not just important in September, it's important all year round, so we encourage you to stay involved. You can follow us on social media, you can sign up for our newsletter, and you can always reach out to me at Sierra Community House. Mental Health in the Mountains started as a speaker series back in 2016 uh, as a partnership with UC Davis and has evolved over the years. Um, this year, we decided to revamp it for Suicide Prevention Month, and we brought in three fantastic speakers. Today closes out our September series, and then we will go back to the drawing board with the feedback that you provide, and we will determine who to bring in next and how to roll it out. But we had a great presentation from Dr. Sally Spencer Thomas on September 14th. We had a two hour community resilience training with uh, Lori Strand and tonight we have Desiree Stage joining us. We also had a handful of fantastic community trainings including virtual mental health first aid, virtual youth mental health first aid, we had a know the signs gatekeeper training and we have QPR gatekeeper trainings online, on demand, anytime. So go to life, tahoelifeline.org slash training to check that out. We will be launching our um, October training schedule and that will come out in our newsletter next week. So Zoom webinar, logistics and etiquette. This is being recorded and it will be made available on YouTube following this presentation, along with um, any uh, resources that Desiree provides to us. Um, Desiree and I have audio and video, but you do not in this web webinar format. Um, so if you would like to speak with anyone, you can use the chat features. We do not have a poll today. There are polls sometimes that we use, but today we're not going to be doing any polls. Um, I do want to make sure that you have some important phone numbers programmed into your phone. Um, I want you to start with the Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 1-800-273-TALK. Another important number to have programmed is 741-741, that is the crisis text line. And locally, uh, we have the Sierra Community House helpline, 1-800-736-1060. If you're looking for local resources, you can go to the tahoelifeline.org slash crisis resources. At the conclusion of today's event, we will have contact information for staying in touch and following Desiree. Um, I will have an evaluation and we also have a hope challenge for the month. We're asking people to share what brings them hope and we will be raffling off um, three gift certificates on October 1st. So um, 
what's the YouTube address? So um, I can get a link for that and drop it in for you uh, shortly. Um, if you do go to our website, the YouTube link is down at the very bottom of the um, website so that you can access it there. So tahoelifeline.org, the bottom of the website is our YouTube link and I will find it in just a moment. Good question. So, I would like to introduce you to Desiree. Um, Desiree has been a phenomenal advocate for those with lived experience. She shares her own story and, um, and has met with hundreds and hundreds of people who have lived through um, some of the same experiences that she has lived through. Um, she puts a voice uh, to those who have struggled to be able to um, put into words what they have gone through. And so with that, I am going to turn it over to Desiree to bring us live through this. All right. Hello. Thank you. Let's see if TAC wants to cooperate with us. Share my screen. Maybe. <laughs> All right. Almost there. Okay. Yay, it's me. <laughs> um, so I'm Des, hi. Uh, I want to start my talk with a land acknowledgement. Um, the land I'm presenting from is part of the traditional unceded territory of the Lenny Lenape people. Uh, also known as Philadelphia. Um, the Lenape were one of the oldest tribes, are one of the oldest tribes in the Northeast, um, known for being diplomats, um, kind of taking care of things, negotiating, and of course, hospitable toward first colonizers, but eventually threatened, um, forcibly removed, murdered, um, and sent west to Oklahoma. Though um, we do still have uh, in, in Philly, uh, Native American population of 13,000 people who identify as Lenape, Cherokee, Creek, and Cree. Um, so I always like to do that. Um, I forgot to mention my pronouns are she and her. I'm trying to, to do that all the time now. Um, yeah, let's do this. So this is me. We already saw this part. <laughs> I'm a, a photographer, a writer, uh, an MSW student now studying to be a clinician so I can, you know, complain from, from both sides of the aisle. Um, and a suicidologist. I've been studying suicidology for, I guess, 10 years, probably pretty formally. Um, I am originally from Miami, but I've lived in a ton of places all over Florida, Tennessee for a few years, New York City for nearly a decade before I landed in Philly with my family, um, and I love it here. My my family growing up, my family's from Pennsylvania, so it's it's was not planned getting here, but, um, you know, ended up here, so I love it. Uh, so I'm, I'm did the beach thing, the Florida thing, um, that's where I'm from. I'm also, I'm a daughter. This is my mom on my wedding weekend with me. I am a sibling to these two special people. <laughs> I don't know if I believe in soulmates, but if they're real, I am almost positive I found and married mine. That was a good day. Would live it again, 10-10. Um, I like tattoos, beer, bourbon, documentaries, true crime, um, memoirs about artists and, and, you know, podcasts about all of these things. I love music, all kinds, indie, top 40, country, Motown, alternative, Tori Amos, Taylor Swift, Dolly Parton. Um, I am a mom. I have these two amazing, infuriating, hilarious babies who are 15 months apart. This is actually probably over a year ago at this point definitely over a year ago. Um, these are my babies. This is Gus, my wife carried Gus, and this is Theo. She looks just like me. Um, this is all of us, just being all of us. Um, all of this to say, you know, my life is, my life is amazing. Oh, nope, not that part yet. My life is amazing. Uh, it's everything I could have ever wished for and far, far beyond, but, um, you know, there's other stuff too. Uh, suicide has been a part of my life since I was a kid, and I think like anything else, or maybe more than anything else, suicide is, is one of the most complicated things I've ever um, encountered, and I've seen it from, from more angles than I'd care to, you know, not just from the lived experience angle, but um, all of that compelled me to dedicate my life to, to trying to make some change 
uh, around suicide. So my dog, of course, wants to go out. And luckily, I have a video to show you. So I'm going to push play, let the dog out, and I'll be right back. And this will introduce you to Live to This. Live Through This is a series of portraits and true stories of suicide attempt survivors across the United States. So the catalyst for starting the project was um, personal experiences I had with depression, with self-injury, with um, my own suicide attempts, and I also lost friends to suicide. And I noticed that we don't talk openly about our personal experiences with suicide and with suicidal thoughts and suicidal feelings. And I just wanted to change that. Live Through This is important because it's important for people to see that there's hope after an attempt and that there's people out there like them and they're not alone. Not feeling alone is a big deal as a human being. If, if people don't understand it, this might give them a chance to see like, you know, there's a human here, you know. It is something I think that a lot of people maybe deal with at some point in time. And it's nice to just uh, have some solidarity there for them and with them, you know. A lot of suicide attempt survivors have never told the story from front to back because they've never been encouraged to. So I give them that space. And afterwards, I make a portrait. To see people's souls within their eyes, it was amazing to be able to create that that bond that you're not alone, it could help so many others. I've seen suicide from so many different angles, and so I understand it from an academic perspective, but more importantly, I understand it from lived experience, from a very personal perspective. So when I sit down with somebody and they tell me their story, they know that they're sitting with somebody who's been there too. When I found the project, I thought, wow, fantastic. You know, this is a way for me to talk without somebody giving me a really strange look or trying to give me medication or trying to lock me up or telling me how wrong I was about something. And to be able to have a conversation with someone else who's experienced that, you know you're not going to be judged. Um, and to be able to open up and be honest about that experience, I felt like I was at, like being hurt with every single word. I want people to come away understanding suicide better or wanting to understand it better. I want them to be more open to talking about it because one thing we know is that asking about suicide saves lives. And we just need to reach out and say we can talk about it, we can approach it, it does happen and the more we're scared of it the more difficult it can be for people who face it because they know they have nowhere to go. And that feeling of having nowhere to go and no one to speak with kind of makes it worse in the first place. It connects us to our stories, not only for the stories that we're reading of other attempt survivors, but the stories that are untold within ourselves. And it gives us hope and an opportunity to know that recovery is possible. The story's ready to be told to everybody. Get it out there, let people see that I'm a regular human being. When I listen to the stories of suicide attempt survivors like me, I don't hear weakness. I don't hear selfishness. I hear courage. I hear compassion. I hear resilience. I hear survival. I hear life. You know, this project is not about death. This project is about life. That's why I called it Live Through This. The people who are on that brink, they say, like, listen, like, there's a whole nother side to this. There is so much love in the world still. So, like, soldier on, man. You know what I mean? If y'all like that song, you should look Charlotte Martin up. She is one of my favorite singers in the whole world. Um, she lives in California. And that song's called Redeemed. Um, I love it so much. I had her write the word on a piece of paper once and I got it tattooed on my arm. I love it. Um, anyway, enough talking about my favorite musicians for a minute. Um, so for me, it's really important that we center the voices of lived experience. Uh, okay, <laughs> I suddenly had to make sure I was unmuted. Um, 
it's important to me that we center the voices of lived experience in order not only to create community, um, but also to flesh out the complexity and explore the nuances of suicide. I think that's something that, that we're really lacking um, in conversations. I've had a few experiences in, in my life that felt as lonely and as isolating as being suicidal. And I was recently, I was trying to think about it recently because, you know, if you don't have something to compare it to, it's, you know, it could be hard to understand. So the one, there are two that I came up with, but one is losing a parent. Um, and I lost my grandfather in April. Um, for all intents and purposes, he was my father. You know, I grew up with him. He, he took me to school every day and from, you know, preschool, kindergarten, up to high school, woke me up every morning. Um, you know, he was just, he was, he was my dad. Um, I'm not going to cry. Uh, and because of COVID, um, my family didn't get to grieve the way we should have. And that kind of loss of losing a part of who you are, um, your history, the possibility that there are questions you might come up with one day um, about you or your family that now can never be answered. Um, memories gone that they took with them. That is an experience that cannot be known without being felt. Um, and I knew that I knew that immediately after my dad died about 12 years ago and, and my mom, you know, would try to comfort me. And it just wasn't getting through. And now she knows and it's awful, but that's, it's just, I don't know, it's, it's incomparable. And I think suicide is like that. Um, losing someone, experiencing, being suicidal, I think it's the same. Um, even if we know everything there is to know about suicide, you know, in, in terms of research and we don't, there's a certain quality to that feeling of that lived experience that informs and completes, you know, the, the knowing, the whole picture. And I just, I think we can't have one without the other. Um, based on my work and my studies over the past decade, I firmly believe that no one is immune to this. Um, and so to me, that, that complete knowing um, is really imperative to making change. And it requires the leadership of people with lived experience. Um, so I'm gonna tell you my story because lived experience is, is a big part of my work. Um, the first time, first time I heard about suicide, I was two or three. It's one of my first memories and it was um, a family friend, someone I loved very, very much. It was a coworker of my grandmother's. Um, and I, I remember the feeling of, you know, this is something we don't talk about. I recently asked my mom how old I was because I thought, you know, I had to be, I knew I was single digits, but I was like, I had to be a little older. Uh, and she was like, no, you were, you were two or three. Um, I think that's, you know, just, just really, really interesting um, how it, it affects you when, when you hear about it. Um, so that was, that was one. Um, and then the transition from middle school to high school is really hard on me. I, um, this slide is a little early, but this is my friend, Brian. I, um, stopped sleeping at night. I started sleeping in classes. I started failing classes, which had never really happened before. I managed to fail marching band once. Not sure how I did that. Um, my relationships with my parents suddenly felt really impossible to navigate. Um, my friends were all dating. I couldn't connect with people. I was questioning my sexuality. And I was just so deeply lonely in all of that. Um, and, you know, I think all of it came together. I experienced depression for the first time. I had suicidal thoughts for the first time. I started hurting myself to feel better. Um, and all of that was happening. And then when I was in 10th grade, my friend Brian took his life. And this is, this is him. It was a, a picture a friend gave to me a couple years ago. Um, and so, you know, part of, part of my work is, is in honoring Brian, but um, you know, this, his loss sent me into a spiral of grief. Um, and I remember I would lock myself in my bedroom and, and listen to that terrible Sarah McLaughlin song that is on the commercial that everyone changes the TV when it comes on. I don't know if they still play that. I don't have cable, but my grandmother would ask me, why do you, why do you care so much? Um, you know, she would say he's an idiot. He was selfish. And I was like, I, I care because I lost my friend and he's never coming back. Um, you know, and he was in pain and he didn't know who to ask for help or maybe how to ask for help. He might not have felt like he could ask for help. Um, and that felt so obvious to me. Um, but I think what she couldn't see in, in addition to Brian's story was that I was feeling all of those things too. 
Um, and then I didn't think I could ask for help because I was just a kid. Uh, you know, whatever I was feeling couldn't compare to the adult problems that I was seeing all around me. Um, there was a lot going on in my family. You know, there were, there were some gambling issues, some drug use, cops at 2 a.m., um, 72 hour holds and psych wards. And how could any of what I was feeling compare to that? That was how I felt. I just, how, how could that be valid? Um, so, this is good. Uh, from the perspective of this 37 year old sitting here today, um, I don't think we give enough credence to the complex inner lives of teenagers. You know, every feeling is amped up. Everything feels big and hard and lonely because it's the, it's the first time you're feeling it. You know, it, I don't know, for me, adulthood, a lot of it is about practice. Um, and I think that we forget about that feeling of the first time as we get older. Uh, and we invalidate young people when we should be supporting them, even if we think, you know, their breakups are silly or whatever they're going through. Um, I attempted suicide for the first time in the summer of 2000, probably around the time that picture on the right side was taken. It's me and my first love. Um, you know, I was 17 and I was in the middle of probably one of many breakups with, with her. And um, this was also around the time that we were outed against our will uh, and her mom threatened to kill me when she found out. Um, I have no recollection of, of the attempt. Um, I only know because I was going through an old journal one day and I, I found this entry and it, it struck me. I was just like, I, I don't remember that at all. But what I wrote about was very clearly describing a suicide attempt. Um, so yeah, and then I moved um, from Miami, where, where I'm from, to Orlando for college uh, in the fall of 2001. And we all know what happened then. I didn't handle the transition well. I think I moved just a couple months before 9-11. Uh, but 9-11 feels kind of like the way that, um, you know, the boomers described JFK. You all, you knew where you were. For me, it was a bright sky Tuesday morning and I had just failed my first college chemistry test. Failed all the rest of them after that too. Uh, I heard the news and I thought the world was ending. I just was not okay. I had nightmares for weeks. I was homesick. I'd call my parents and I'd cry and I'd cry wasn't sleeping. I was still hurting myself. Failed all my classes. Um, had a breakup. It was just one thing after the next. And I, I just, I was flailing. So I went home that, that winter. And I remember, um, I remember that was when my family decided that it was, you know, it was time for me to see somebody. And so they took me to our, you know, our family doctor who I think my grandparents saw him for 30 or 40 years. So he was very familiar with you know, who we were. Uh, and he said, do you cry a lot? Are you sad a lot? Are you sleeping more than usual? Are you eating more than usual? Have you gained weight? Have you lost weight? All of those things. And, you know, based on my answers, he gave me a prescription for an antidepressant. He didn't ask about what, what I was going through beyond those few questions. Um, you know, he just kind of sent me on my way. And depression was my first diagnosis. So the next spring I had, I'm not going to really go into it today, but you know, things got worse. Uh, and that was, that was the impetus for me to seek therapy. I didn't know how to get through what I was going on or what was going on in my life. But I come from, you know, hard workers who keep their heads down and they live their lives privately. And therapy was not a thing that we did. I didn't know anything about it. I don't even think, uh, I don't even think it was a thing that we didn't do, you know, like intentionally so much as it just never really entered the equation for us. Uh, kind of looking back, I almost think that maybe if ignoring your problems or thinking positively wasn't enough, it was like there was a pill for that, you know, and I had the pill. Um, so it didn't come naturally to me to, to look for therapy and I didn't know what to do or, or who to look for or what kinds of things to look for in them. Um, it didn't go well. <laughs> as it often doesn't. I think it would have been helpful for me to know that finding the right therapist is a lot like dating. <laughs> you have to go on a lot of first dates um, before you find the right one. And that's if you have access, you know, if you have that privilege of access, if you have the privilege of choice, if you're not limited by, you know, an X number of semesters in a, in a university, um, it's really hard. Uh, and I think, I think helping people advocate for themselves early on would be great. But 
it went on like this for years. I didn't learn to advocate for myself until I was 30. So sometimes I was in therapy because I had access. Uh, sometimes I wasn't. Sometimes I was on meds because I had insurance. Sometimes I wasn't because they made me feel like a zombie. My coping skills were not great. Um, everything hurt. I didn't know how to change it. I thought those were my only options, meds, therapy, and I just felt like a raw nerve all the time. And so I met this girl. We had this whirlwind summer romance. She had to go back to Tennessee in the fall. We were in Florida. And I walked away from absolutely everything I had to be with her. I had just gotten into my dream school. I walked away from my family and friends. Everything. I just left. Um, she was all I had. So I clung to her. And it was the beginning of, of this dangerous cycle of codependence that we had between us. I'm newly on ADD meds. And they make my mouth very dry. So I apologize. Um, so dangerous cycle of codependence. I waited tables full time. Uh, for the first year, and I started to have unrelenting panic attacks. Those were pretty bad. Um, the relationship became more volatile. Our lives became more and more intertwined. We lived together. We worked together. We went to school together. We shared a bank account. We had the same friends. We never left each other's side. And one day, she threatened to hit me. And then another day, she pushed me. And then, you know, later... She started to hit me in places where the bruising would be covered by my clothing and no one else could see it until, you know, finally one day we were screaming at each other and she just punched me right in the face and, and knocked me out and um, left me with a black eye. And I had to go to work that way. And, you know, our friends saw it and it was just everything about it was devastating in a lot of ways. And at some point in the middle of all of it, I started hitting back. And there are very few things in my life that have made me hate myself in in the way that I hated myself for that because it shook me. It shook everything I thought I knew about who I was. Um, it was hard. And I gave ultimatum after ultimatum about how we needed to get better, about how people who loved each other shouldn't hurt each other. Uh, and it didn't get better and I couldn't leave. And it was, these were things that I had seen in my life, but I kind of thought that I was immune to it because I was gay. Turns out that's not the case. Um, it was really just, just hard. And I felt, I fell further and further into this deep hole. Uh, and so I got back into school. I was going to school full time. I was working full time. I lived in fear of the next argument that we might have, um, terrified she was going to leave me, but I, I couldn't fathom being alone. So suicidal thoughts became this kind of everyday occurrence for me, um, instead of a sometimes occurrence. I moved forward, you know, but I couldn't see past the day I was living in, in, on any day. I bought a car to escape the fights and instead that became a weapon. And I started fantasizing about how I could use it to end my life. Um, so no one would know that I just wanted to die. I really didn't know what to do. And probably in my last, one of my last two semesters, I finally found an amazing therapist at, at, at the university. I would probably credit her with keeping me alive. I also saw a psychiatrist for the first time and I got another diagnosis of bipolar disorder. I got new meds to add to my old ones. Um, but then none of that lasted long because you know, you, I got eight sessions and that was it. I had to solve my problem in eight sessions uh, to fix all of that. So in the summer of 2006, after I'd graduated, I learned that my girlfriend was cheating on me and I just, unraveled uh, and I attempted suicide again. This is the only, this is the only suicide attempt I remember. Um, but you know, she was, I'm not going to talk about this, but I would love if you guys just went and, and, and checked that Twitter thread. Uh, my girlfriend was somewhere else that night. She wouldn't come home. She knew that I was uh, in a place and uh, she called the cops for a welfare check. So they, I, and I didn't know though. So they barged into my apartment demanding, you know, to know who I was and, and what I'd done. And I was terrified um, because I'd, I'd seen this happen and having cops show up at your house in the middle of the night and take you away was, you know, I, I have a lot of stuff around that and it was scary. And then it was happening to me and um, they're like, who are you? What have you done? And I was like, I don't know. And so I, I called my mom. And uh, she gave I, gave, I gave them the phone and she talked to them 
told them all they needed to know about me and they gave me the phone again and she said look you you're going to the hospital tonight you don't have a choice about that but you do have one choice and it's um whether you are going to go voluntarily or whether you're going to fight this and if you fight it you're going to get handcuffed so uh i chose i chose to go willingly and I rode in an ambulance to the hospital and no one talked to me. Uh, I spent a few hours alone in this cold beige hospital room. At that point, texts were still 25 cents each. Can you imagine the amount of money we'd be spending if texts were 25 cents? <laughs> I still had one of those little razor flip phones. Um, it was like a whole different world. So I was really left alone with my thoughts in that room. Um, I realized this is, this is my good survivor moment, but it did happen. I realized things needed to change and I needed to stop hurting myself. And that meant leaving the abusive relationship. It meant trying to stop cutting myself. It meant, you know, finding better ways to deal with my feelings, finding a way out of these obsessive, relentless, suicidal thoughts. Cause I think, I think if I wouldn't have had that moment, I probably would have died um, by suicide. The hospital experience was really scary in the moment. There were, there were things that happened that were, pretty traumatic for me. Um, I've heard, I've heard worse stories. I'm not going to lie to me, you know, in the end, it's, it's really disheartening that the people who are there to help us, um, hurt us and that, you know, when we need help, we're often humiliated, treated with, re with resentment, forcibly restrained physically and chemically, you know, and, and again, it's by the people who are supposed to help us like that night, they wouldn't let me put on a bra to leave, to leave my, my house. And that felt so humiliating. And it's just such a little thing, but if a lot of people are you're socialized as a woman, you don't leave the house without your bra on. Come on. Um, so, you know, just these, these tiny little things. Um, and based on the quality of care I received that night, I feel extra lucky that I got out within three hours um, and that I wasn't sent to a locked ward. Um, I will give you proof of why that, that is deeply important to me in this particular experience. These are my discharge papers beautiful description of depression, abrasions. And if you, if you zoom in to that second page, it tells me to follow up in one day at the number 000000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000. all the zeros, have you called that number? It doesn't work. It does not work. Um, so what if I had wanted more of their help? What would I have done then? Um, insult to injury uh, about, uh, I don't know, Two weeks later, I got a $1,500 bill for that 10 minute ambulance ride. And I was 23 and broke. And that felt really, I didn't know what I was gonna do with that bill or how I was gonna pay it. Um, but what got me through, which was not the care I received that night, what got me through was the kindness and the support that I received from the people who love me. Um, and I think that's, that's big. Uh, you know, it was my mom making sure I had a ride home from the hospital, even though she was in Florida and I was in Tennessee. It was my friend Allison leaving a party, 110% wasted with a sober friend who drove her to come get this stranger to him in the hospital and pick me up. And then they took me to Taco Bell and we had tacos. Um, you know, it was, it was my best friend wiring me money and saying, come to me and I will take care of you in Texas. Uh, so a week later, I quit my job and I drove 16, uh, 16 hours, a thousand miles to get to her. And she took care of me while I, you know, figured out how to rebuild my life from scratch. And this is us probably <coughs> the day I got there, I think. Um, that's Kat. We've been best friends since we were 15. So I moved back home to Miami briefly after that. I spent, I think, about a month in Texas uh, at Kat's house and moved back to Miami grieved my breakup. One of my best friends died from suicide. Grieved that. I lived 10 minutes from my family. I rarely visited them. I made these reckless decisions. Uh, I just wasn't okay. And one of the decisions I made was to move to New York City with only what would fit in my car uh, to a room in an apartment that I had never seen before with three roommates I had never met. <laughs> but it was not actually in New York City at all, but across the Hudson River in New Jersey, about a half, a month, half an hour away by bus. Um, but New York is home. It's one of my homes. Um, I had no friends when I got there. I wasn't, I wasn't going, you know, like, like Texas. I just, I, I went and I was going to see what happened. I didn't, I didn't, 
when I left Tennessee, I felt like I didn't have a future. Um, so this was, this was creating something out of nothing. Had no friends. I had this camera and I had learned, I started, you know, doing photography as a hobby in Tennessee. So I carried my camera around. I was lonely. I was depressed. I was grieving, broke, unemployed. I had this hobby. Um, and that camera became my lifeline. I took it everywhere I went. It's how I coped with everything that hurt because again, I, I knew how to cut myself. That was, that was the, that was the extent of what I knew how to do with my extreme emotions. And so the camera became a surrogate. Um, suicidal thoughts came and went mostly I didn't myself. Sometimes I did. Uh, and then I would start over trying to, to forgive myself, um, for, for that slip up. And the thing about cutting, if you don't know much about it is it works. And that's why I think it's so scary for people. Um, it allowed me to make my emotional pain physical. Um, it allowed me to feel like my pain was real because I could see it. It wasn't just in my head. Um, so that when you have something that works, it's hard to break a habit. Um, and I, I still have the urges sometimes. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's been a, it's been a hard road for me with that. I got a job at a record label licensing music videos during the day. And then I would sneak my camera into concerts at night because it was like, I work at a record label, let me in. And so I started, I started photographing uh, musicians who I really loved. And that was kind of my, my entry into professional photography. Photographing concerts is really hard. <clears throat> there are rules. You get into the photo pit, you get three songs, no flash, and you have to get everything you need. Every shot you need for, you know, whom, whomever you're shooting for. Uh, people move, lights change, you have to develop a, a kind of intuition. The camera has to be an extension of you. Eventually my work was good enough that I started working on assignment for, for um, blogs and, and magazines. And so I was photographing, interviewing some of my heroes and I loved it, but I, suicide had always been the thing that I cared about and the thing that I wanted to work on as, as a, a grown up. And I wasn't doing that. I wasn't making the contribution I had hoped I would. So, you know, I just kind of was like, how can I use my camera to do this? <laughs> Uh, and at the same time as I was thinking about that, I was making the move to professional photo work, uh, shooting a lot of weddings, photographing a lot of weddings, excuse me. I wanted to start a portrait project that was more personal. So I went back to suicide and I thought, you know, what, what about this experience with the suicide attempt? Um, you know, the, the years that I'd spent suicidal hurting myself, feeling scared and alone and crazy. Like, why didn't I know anybody with these experiences? So I pulled up Google. I didn't know what to type in or how to describe my experience, what to call myself at the time. Uh, so I typed suicide survivor and I hit enter and this is what I found. Um, you know, I, think I, I think this particular screenshot is from 2013, but I did, you know, I initially started in 2010. Um, every hit for suicide survivor matched the one facet of my experience, which was loss, but nothing matched the trying to die experience and I found myself when I did find myself it was in anonymous statistics all I saw were these numbers and they were numbers that may not have even been accurate because reporting isn't accurate what we think we know about suicide in terms of numbers that's not real um sometimes the cause of death is ambiguous sometimes the true cause of death isn't reported because of shame uh, a lot of suicide attempts aren't reported at all the numbers are not telling us the truth. It manifests, suicide manifests differently for people with different racial, ethnic, cultural backgrounds. We don't know how it affects these marginalized communities. So we're likely not catching a lot of important data. Gender, we have, we have a, a statistic, I think, you know, women attempt suicide three times more than men, but men die by suicide four times more than women. So what happens to all the people who don't fall on either side of that binary? Um, what about, I don't know, so many things I can think of. So I think those numbers around the side attempts and suicide deaths are probably larger than, than we know. Um, and I think that's important. So eventually I found the Lifeline Gallery. I don't know that it exists anymore, but it was just kind of a series of, of nameless disembodied voices telling bits of their stories. I still wasn't finding the human connection. And that, that was what I wanted to go for. I have this 
hunch that suicide's so difficult for us to wrap our minds around in part because of that lack of humanity and how we present it to the world in those statistics. You know, humans, we're a social species and we're moved when we have a story to connect to. And that wasn't there. Um, so, you know, I decided I was gonna, I was gonna find my community. I was gonna find my people and I was gonna ask them to share their stories and then make their portraits. I wanted to breathe that humanity into these stories. I wanted people to feel empowered to reclaim their stories, to feel proud of them, to feel proud of, you know, having gotten through that, to put their names and their faces to them um, and to say I survived and I'm surviving. Um, and I call the project Live Through This because it's what we did and it's what we do. And it's the name of one of my favorite albums by Holt. Um, it took a while to find people who were willing to take a chance on this idea. And I don't want to go into detail, but uh, I didn't make the first portrait for the project until 2011. So when I sit down with an attempt survivor, uh, my prompt is tell me your name, how old you are, what you do, your story as you see fit to tell it. I give them a neutral platform to say whatever it is they need or want to say about their experiences. What led up to the attempt, what it feels like to be suicidal, what happened after, how they survived, how they still struggle. They're in control the whole time of their narrative. I want them to share only what feels safe, only what feels important. As attempt survivors, you know, we're often put in a position where our autonomy is taken from us, where people make decisions for our own good without consulting us. And that can lead to trauma heaped upon trauma. And so when, when, I've, when I've got people with lived experience with me, I want them to always feel like the power is in their hands. Um, and I listen and I hold space because that's what, you know, many of these people are telling me that no one has ever wanted to hear their story before. Um, and, and then I'm also a stranger. So, you know, I'm, I'm there to listen and to be with them. All they really know about me is that I've been there too. And then I'm not going to judge them. For so many of us, uh, being able to talk about it at all, let alone safely to someone who wants to listen is new. Uh, you know, no need to feel shame, no need to fear judgment, or worry about having the cops called, no being told to set it down, let it go, buck up, get over it. No claims of selfishness or laziness or weakness, no recounting all there is to live for, just telling and listening, you know, just a story between two people. Um, I recently added in a bunch more portraits and now my timing is all off. So I'm gonna let this go for a second. It's almost done. This is 10 years of portraits uh, uh, all around the, the country. Um, the next thing I'm gonna show you once, once everyone goes through here is actually a video of, of what an interview looks like just for a couple of minutes. Uh, I wanna take you into the room with me. Um, so the video is of Lagamas George. I interviewed her in Alaska in 2017. I'd gotten a grant and there were a couple stories uh, that, that I just really wanted to, to capture that I didn't have the funding for. So flew all the way to Alaska to meet her. And here is what she has to say about how she holds hope. For me, I, am traditionally usually a pessimist but I think I believe there's a small place in my head and my heart that hope resides I don't feed it very often I don't take very good care of it I don't think but it's always there. And even on my worst days, even in my most difficult situations, that little bit of hope to grasp onto, even if you can only hold it for a second, is essential. And I believe that most people have that. If you look hard enough and if you focus on it, there's always one thing, one moment, one thought, one feeling, a smell, a taste that triggers that hope. For me, I've got lots of different things that trigger hope now. 
my son's laugh from the time he was very little I his laugh has saved me so many times the smell of sea air like when you're out on a boat the taste of fresh fried bread like right out of the fryer it's still hot and you practically burn your mouth off but that taste all of those little things that you find pleasure in those are your connections to hope don't ignore them don't sweep them away don't dismiss them even when you're at your lowest because that's you that's some part of you wanting to survive that's some part of you wanting to be there because if you can find pleasure in these things then there is something that you like about your life there is something to be here for there's something to hold on to and it might not be much but sometimes all you need is a small something Damn. <laughs> right? <laughs> Damn. Well, I forgot to edit that part out <laughs> in my new video today. Uh, so that's what it looks like. We usually talk for about an hour. And when the survivor's done telling their story, I take them outside to make a portrait. I think there's something very important about looking into someone's eyes after they've just shared all of that with you. I ask them to look into the lens when I make the portraits. I don't tell them to smile, be serious. What you see in the portrait is, is them on that day in that moment, what they were feeling. I kind of look like it, I, I kind of look at it like a time capsule, um, especially because it takes me a long time to get the portraits and the stories up. Uh, it prompts the viewer to do something that we don't usually to do as well with the portrait, to make eye contact. Um, we've always looked away from suicide people experiencing suicidal thoughts, those who lived, those with, you know, who, who have had someone lost to suicide. But I, I didn't want that with, with Live Through This. And I take, I take survivors outside for a reason too. So this is Nicole, a very good friend of mine. And hers is the first portrait that I ever made for the project. You can see, you know, there's a beautiful light on her hair and in her eyes. I wanted it to be this glossy studio lit thing. And I love her expression, but as I was editing the, the portrait, I realized putting people on a black background after I'm asking them to tell me about their suicide attempt might seem a little morbid. Um, and I'm not here to shock people or provide the world with more sensationalism. Um, there's, there's plenty of that out there. This work that I'm doing is, is about life and, and how our struggles are a part of life. Um, you know, how waking up and choosing to stay or even being forced to stay and struggling through is a triumph. Um, so from that day on, I photograph people pretty much outdoors uh, in natural light, you know, and in, in, try to take themselves out of. I don't screen people for the project. If they're willing to show up, I'm willing to show up. I have, I only have a couple of rules, you know, you got to be 18. That's the age of consent legally. Um, you got to use your full name and likeness. Uh, the one thing I like is, is if people are a year out from their most recent attempt, and then they have to be okay with everything going on the website because Project's Home is online. Um, there are so few resources out there for us that I wanted to create something that anybody could access for free at any time. Um, it, you know, in terms of mental health resources and, and suicide prevention resources, they're, they're hard to come by. Uh, and so when you type in the URL, livethroughthis.org, this is what it looks like. You get this giant grid of people who are different in so many ways, but who are connected by these experiences with suicide um, and the experience of telling their story. It, Live Through This is the only project in existence that I, I, I'm, I believe um, where the stories are shared in such large volume, depth, every story probably is about 30 pages if you were to put it in a Word document, 20 to 30 pages, um, the ones that I took, that I've done in the past five or six years, and not a single one of them is anonymous or hidden away. Um, 
so switching gears real fast, going back to my story for a second. In 2012, after being one of the first gay people in New York to get married, I enjoyed the recognition of being one of the first gay people to get divorced in New York State. Um, that made me suicidal. I was suicidal again a year after in 2013 when Cosmo approached me to write this story for them um, because all of that writing meant reliving something that was very traumatic for me. Uh, my girlfriend, now my wife, encouraged me to get help. Uh, she came with me to see my new therapist, got diagnosed with anxiety. I agreed to try meds again. That same year, I, I had started working on this project, but I was kind of paralyzed by it. And she was like, you know, we started dating and she was like, you are the most fun person I've ever met. I think all you are is fun. Like, I'm not sure you do anything other than be fun. So you've been talking about this project. Are you going to do it? And I was like, oh, well, okay. <laughs> so I put together this Kickstarter campaign, um, which is a crowdfunding thing. And you, you ask for however much money you think you need for a project and it's kind of all or none. People have to, to support you, um, you know, with as little as a dollar or as much as they want. But you have to get the full amount that you're requesting or you get nothing. And so 600 people thought Live Through This was, was worthwhile. I wanted to take it on the road, take it out of New York, gather as many stories of as many different kinds of people as possible. Um, $23,000 in 30 days. I thought this was just going to be something that was, you know, lived on a little corner of the internet. I didn't know that, um, you know, the live through this would, would become what it is. Uh, and, and still the project runs on, on funds from supporters, which isn't saying a ton, but I can keep the website running, <laughs> uh, with the monthly donations. And, uh, in, hold on. In 2015, Phil and I got married. I showed you those pictures already. We went on this epic honeymoon. I won an award for my work. Phil got offered a job as a professor here in Philly. We left New York City. We also got a puppy because y'all need pictures of puppies and suicide presentations. And that's Dolly Parton on the left and Canelita on the right. Canelita is our older dog. Um, just as we moved to Philly, my grandfather had a health scare and that sent my family into a scramble. There was nothing I could do to fix it and I'm kind of the fixer in my family. Um, and I found myself back in this familiar place of being suicidal and hurting myself. And if you've seen the movie, The S Word, there is a, a, a scene where I'm kind of filming myself and I'm crying and I'm in my backyard saying that I cut myself and I lied to my wife about it. And that's, that's then. It's the hardest scene in the movie for me to watch. Um, it was around, around that time that my therapist told me that my bipolar diagnosis wasn't real, that I had, you know, lived for all of these years with all of the la that labeling that comes with that bipolar um, diagnosis and, and that it wasn't real, that I was just anxious with a propensity for depression. Um, all of that internalization wasn't real. And I was like, okay, so I'm just supposed to, like, what, what happened to all of the terrible things that I felt because of that? Um, so that's the thing. Um, and then two years later, when Phil and I started planning for the babies, we planned for the possibility that I would probably experience PPD. Um, what we didn't experience, or what we didn't plan for was the depression that I experienced during pregnancy somehow. I was so sick and I was in so much pain the whole nine months. Um, and I put my body through so much to get pregnant. Um, I went through four inseminations, five IVF cycles, a miscarriage. This number two here, that was our, our winning horse. That's my daughter, Theo. Um, the depression hit about four months in and I felt trapped in my body and I started to have these terrible suicidal thoughts again and they were the worst. I, they were the worst that I'd ever experienced because I didn't have a way out. Suicide was not an option while I was growing this tiny human. Um, never did get PPD. Uh, so weaving my life back into my work because they're intertwined and because the work is so personal to me um, and because suicidal thoughts are a part of my life and I kind of want to illustrate that it wasn't just tied to um, a mental illness diagnosis. You know, I'm showing you all the ways that this is manifested for me, sometimes linked to those diagnoses, but you know, other times infertility, that, that breaks you, you know, in lots of ways, those experiences. Um, and you know, I mentioned it earlier, as it turns out, one of the things that I didn't know my whole life is now I have a new diagnosis of ADD and, and in, I don't, I don't, love diagnoses, but I like to use them in order to help me figure out what's going on when, I, when they're new to me. And I had no idea. So this fell into place. And these are the things I struggled with my whole life, my inability to focus, 
uh, to organize my thoughts, my things, forgetting to eat because I, because figuring out what to eat overwhelms me, um, my extreme emotions, my bad self-esteem. And then I look at the DSM because I'm taking a class this semester and I see that people who have, who, who live with ADHD are often diagnosed as bipolar too. And I just am so furious about it. Um, and I, I don't even, I don't have a, you know, I can't tie this one together yet because I'm still living it, but it's, that's been really hard for me. Um, so the mental health piece is big, but it's not a whole picture um, and it changes a lot. Uh, yeah, so what I'm going through here, you know, in illustrating this, it really mirrors what so many of the people um, who are in this project are going through, but the only one I can really, the only story I can really tell is my own and the rest are on the website. And I can tell you is some things about the people that I have interviewed. I don't like reducing us to numbers as I've discussed. People ask me all the time, um, what, you know, who is in this project? And at first it was mostly people who identified as white women. And, and as time has passed, um, there's just more representation of all kinds of different people. I've interviewed 189 attempt survivors in 36 cities, Florida, Alaska, in between. Um, this is not, I don't collect demographics. Uh, this is based on what's reported or what's observable or things that I found out after from these people because I keep in touch with most of them. Um, ages 19 to 69, you know, just, you can see all kinds of amazing humans. Um, and also 17 and a half percent of, of the people I interviewed also identify as lost survivors. I think the number is probably actually larger, but there's, there's a good um, amount of crossover between those identities. Some major themes uh, that, that I've noticed, suicidal thoughts recur for a lot of people. The interview that I do is unstructured. You know, we talk for an hour and I, I usually just ask them to tell me their story, but I come back and ask clarifying questions. And then I do ask two questions of everyone. And one of them is, um, is suicide still an option for you? And I asked that question because what I noticed when I was doing my research was that of the few stories that there were available, anonymous, um, there was almost a formula. A terrible thing happened. There was a suicide attempt. They got help in the ways that we expect, in therapy and meds, and then everything was better forever. Um, and that was not true in my experience. And I just kind of felt like it might not be true for other people. So I just started asking. Um, and almost everyone says, yes, it's an option, but I don't want it to be. And I think that's really important. Um, then they explain, you know, what that means to them. It's, it's more of an honest picture of the experience to me, but I think, I think the key is that if we're paying attention to this piece, it means that the ways that we approach um, help and support kind of have to be more of a long-term thing instead of a one-off thing. And I think that that could be kind of an incredible change. Um, do I still have this in here? I'm, we're skipping this, but basically Dr. Eric Beeson says suicidal thoughts can happen on um, a continuum. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that speaks to that idea of suicidal thoughts kind of persisting over time or coming back, waxing and waning. Um, you know, sometimes it's introspection on one end or all, all hands on deck crises, you know, and I think it, people have to know that, to know that there's it, these, the, when someone is suicidal, when you're asking, it's, it's worth exploring and not just kind of crisis immediately, fear immediately, you know, talk about it, dig into it, see, see what it means to the person. Um, the other question I ask is what good things have come from your experiences with suicide? We, we only talk about the negative aspects and there are lots of them, but I wanted to see, you know, people make meaning of things. And so what, what does it mean to, to have attempted? Um, and again, the answer is almost always the same, even more with this one than the first question. My experiences with suicide allow me to better understand others like me and help them. Uh, and I love that. It tells us a lot about the power of peer support, the power of lived experience, how we should be everywhere. Um, again, it's, you don't know it unless you've lived it a lot of the time. Um, so I also wanted to see who was using the site and how. And I collected some data in 2018 just from a pop-up survey. Um, we analyzed some of it. I think we analyzed about 600 responses. And um, lots of people are coming to the website who 
have had suicidal thoughts, half of them almost are attempt survivors. Um, and then people are coming to the site who have loved ones who have been impacted. 36% know someone who, who had suicidal thoughts, almost 30% know someone who attempted. Um, a quarter are, are lost survivors. So suicide continues to devastate us. Uh, and we just got some, some more numbers recently about vets well, yesterday, I believe, uh, that, that, that suicide rates are going up among vets. It's, it's devastating and people with lived experience have to be at every table related to suicidology and suicide prevention. We are what's been missing from this work. I think we're integral to it. And I think when we bring more people with lived experience in, I think that's when then we can really start making the suicide rates go down. Um, so what does that look like having people at the table, having lived experience at the table? Um, this is, let's, I'm gonna use live through this and show you what that could look like for, for people. Um, I have worked with suicidologists on crafting meaningful reporting guidelines on suicide and, and thinking about what our stories should include, what our media stories should, should include, what kinds of questions they should be asking, what should they not be saying, what should they be saying. Um, and I've, I've waffled back and forth. My, my views now don't even align with the guidelines anymore, but I helped write them. Um, I've consulted on apps that use AI to train providers on how to work with us. I also don't agree with that. People should be doing this with this work, but it's fine. Um, I consulted on character development for the Broadway play Dear Evan Hansen. I've done a lot of press. I got to sit in a room and breathe the same air with the Silver Fox once. Um, I produced and co-host this video podcast called Suicide and Stuff. And as you can tell, it's meant to be irreverent. It's meant to be informal and kind of poke fun at our experiences. You know, the paper airplane. They call people who are hospitalized a lot frequent flyers. Um, for me, I, I, have to, I have to laugh to get through it, but I want the idea um, was that I want people to be able to have conversations about this. I want them to be able to talk about it comfortably, comfortably enough that they can weave their life in and out, laugh about something, come back to it, um, you know, and just, just not feel so frightened of it. I think our fear gets in our way a lot. So we approach topics through this critical suicidology lens, but we also talk about our lives, we laugh. Um, we've covered all sorts of things in our first year. We just had our first birthday, from anti-fatness and suicide to incarceration, film, the supernatural, lots of research. We get a lot of suicide researchers on with us um, to how problematic Suicide Prevention Month can be. We've done that a couple times now. Um, therapists are sharing the project with clients. I regularly collaborate with researchers We've used the narratives to ask questions about PTSD, lived experience with mental health care and how it can change, intersecting identities. We can guide this research if we're involved. We can course correct, we can help ask the questions. Um, and also I, I help researchers recruit for their studies a lot. Most important, I think one of the most important things is to live through this as being taught to crisis workers and future clinicians. You are not gonna be able to see the text here but there is a link on the side if you wanna look at this, uh, this issue brief that I wrote about um, the need for, for training among clinicians for suicide. Um, I think I, I, most people don't know that, that clinicians don't receive mandatory routine training. Uh, and I think that's, I think it's shocking and egregious that one of our main messages is to reach out, to tell people to reach out. But, most of the people who are catching us when we fall don't know what they're doing with us. Um, and they're unprepared to provide appropriate care. And the people who can provide appropriate care went and did that on their own. And I think a lot of us who are in this work have been affected. Um, so it's really fulfilling to me to see that this work is playing a role in changing that um, and, and bringing some, some training into clinical programs so yeah, if anyone wants to, to look at this and use it and you know, whatever, the link is on the left side of the screen. Um, the CDC came out with a report in 2018 that showed that 54% of Americans who died by suicide over a 17 year period didn't have a known mental health history. We can tear that number apart all we want. Um, it tells us something important, I think, which again, is that there is an intersection with mental health differences, but there are a lot of other issues at play. Look at that relationship problem, 42%. If you know somebody who just went through a breakup, you should probably check on them. If you know somebody who lost their job, you should probably check on them. Um, 
this is this is key. These are these are life experiences that cause despair. Um, you know, so a diagnosis is one thing. Check on them, but all of these hard life experiences, check on them. Um, and this is what fuels me. We've got to think differently about it. As it stands, we have a PR problem in this field. We are in conflict with ourselves constantly. It makes it very difficult to, shan to land on a shared goal. Um, and it makes it difficult to get people on board who haven't already been affected by suicide. Um, we will tell you that, oh, that slide was supposed to happen a minute ago. We will tell you that suicide is the 10th leading cause of suicide or of death in, in the US overall. It's the second leading cause of death in the 15 to 24 age range. Um, a statement like that, I feel, would lead someone to believe that this is important and worth paying attention to. Um, but then the suicide prevention field itself will push you away and tell you that suicide is a rare event, um, that it's abnormal, and will tell you that it's linked to depression and mental illness. We'll show you pictures like this. It's called a head clutcher, one of my favorite things. I think these pictures are probably why so many people say they had no idea someone they knew was suicidal because that's what we think of when we think of suicide. Um, not all the beautiful faces I just showed you, um, not the people, the survivors we've never met, not the people who haven't told their stories yet and who may never. Um, we'll tell you that suicide is a complex phenomenon, but then we'll follow it up and talk about assessments and screens and risk factors, and we'll sound like robots and all these evidence-based practices that are normed on white people um, that totally ignore the realities of the world we're living in. Again, the breakups. This now is a great time. If suicide, like if COVID, you know, some people are talking about it, but we don't know the numbers yet. We, we're not gonna know them for a while. We don't know how it's affecting people, but if it's this complex, there have to be many ways of knowing about it. There have to be lots of different kinds of responses to it. Um, our body of knowledge around suicide is not as established as we would have people believe. The research is not as rigorous as it should be. It hasn't historically been influenced by or inclusive of the people directly uh, affected. Um, of course, we want answers to rely on. This is terrifying. It's life and death, but we don't have them yet. And so my challenge today um, is to broaden our views on suicide. Um, remember that the path we're on isn't the only way of knowing. How does the view change when we start asking questions and making links? How does the view change when we start asking about how the isms affect suicide, ableism, colonization, white supremacy, structural oppression, forced treatment, misogyny, homophobia, transphobia? How do those impact suicide? Um, or anything else that you care about, how does that impact it? Uh, how does the view change when we acknowledge that it's political, that suicide and, and, and the mental health field carries a long history of abuses. What about when we start linking it to the Nazi experiments that happened and forced sterilization that happened in, in the West, uh, California? When we start talking about mental illness and suicide in the carceral system, when we start talking about the ethics of pulling people from their environments, handcuffing them, taking them to the hospital against their will, this doesn't happen in a vacuum. And I think that part of our problem is that we're locating, locating it inside a person when we, we've gotta be looking around, you know, what's, what's hurting them? Um, we have to look at people in the context of their environments, the current climate, again, COVID. What's happening? How are people despairing? Um, we have to take unique histories, cultures, belief systems, everything about a person. And how do we, how do, how do we best provide support for that person? I'm almost done. <laughs> this is the most important part of my talk. I knew that someday we were going to lose someone in the live through this family. Um, it's the reality of this work and of our lives as attempt survivors. Um, we are at higher risk for suicide and the more people I spoke to I knew the, the higher the statistical likelihood became that it would happen. And Natalie Medina was our first, hold on. Natalie was our first um, loss I interviewed Natalie in Eugene, Oregon in 2014. I loved her. We had this immediate connection. She became a really vocal advocate after she told her story that time for the first time. Um, and she died in the summer of 2016. And I thought that when the day came that, um, that we lost someone, I would have to stop doing this work, that I wouldn't be able to do it anymore. Natalie made sure that I knew that our stories needed to be shared. And so the opposite happened. Um, after her death, I felt more resolved than ever to make sure that, you know, our stories are heard. And two years later, we lost Bob. Um, 
in, in February of 2018, I believe. And Heidi, a couple months later, she was local to me, very vocal advocate around suicide. Um, Stella last year, also just such a, a pot stir in Oklahoma, such an amazing advocate. Um, her son, Christopher, died by suicide in 2010. She called him her shiny penny because um, he had red hair. And her other son, John, is also a suicide attempt survivor. And he, he was in the, the pictures that I showed you guys earlier. Um, and when I think of these people, like this, this project is to honor them, and that's why I, I bring them up. But I also think it's very important to know that every single one of them, if you go and read their stories, Stella's is the only one that's not up right now, they survived great, great trauma. They did what they were supposed to. They did everything they're told to do. And it was still too harsh and their pain was too great and they had to go. And every day they woke up and stayed was a triumph. And I think we forget that when someone struggles for a long time that every day they're here is a good day. The fact that we lost them to me points to um, a big failure in the system. And so when Stella told her story, she said, I don't think humans are supposed to have that much struggle. I don't know if it's genetic, if it's nature or nurture, but I've been around long enough to know that enough of us do. And with the exponential increase in the incidence in suicide, especially with our young people in this nation, it affords me that so little is being done about it. And I think that she's right. What we've been doing isn't enough. So I've got a rapid fire list of not the standard things that we can do. Um, be willing to have the conversation. Know that all the suicidal thoughts that people have aren't crises and be able to dig in, you know, ask about it. Know that some suicidal thoughts are comforting to people. It might not be great, it might be scary to you, but know that that's there. If, if I can think about suicide and thinking about suicide keeps me alive and that saves my life that day, then that's an important suicidal thought and that's not a comfortable thing. That some suicidal thoughts are harm reduction. And sometimes having that option is, is the thing. Um, you gotta be ready to ask the question, to listen, to take time, explore it, don't run in fear, validate it. Just if you, even if you don't, agree with it, just say, that's gotta be hard. Validate it, sit with it, hold it, acknowledge that the world is not set up for some people to exist, let alone to survive or even thrive. Um, always remember that a person's agency should be your primary focus. How do you help them through a crisis while allowing them to stay as in control of what's happening to them as possible? How do you help them through a crisis while you maintain their definition of safety? What keeps them safe? Um, you know, I, I have a family member who was, who was hospitalized and, and his shoes were taken away and he doesn't like to be barefoot. And I understand why his shoes were taken away, but that was distressing for him. Little things, again, reserve 911 for the last resort, that Twitter thread. Um, QT, BP, BIPOC people are at higher risk for, for being harmed if cops are involved. And that's, I don't love it. I don't, I don't love talking about it, but it's true. Um, know that uh, forced hospitalization can result in huge bills like I talked about earlier. Put lived experience at the forefront, partner with us, collaborate with us, legitimize peer support as valid and valuable and um, legitimize being a clinician or a researcher or somebody who we see as a, you know, a professional, um, legitimize them telling their stories because they are there. Um, being able to be open in, in one of those positions would be would be huge because there's a trickle down effect in the field, I think. And if they start being able to reject all the gross prejudice, I think that'll come down in our attitudes about um, lost survivors and some survivors. I think that's hurting us. Let us tell our stories, let them tell, let us tell them how we want to, you know, don't force us into a box in a specific narrative. Um, let us see each other, let us see each other triumph and, and fail and, and rise again. Let us redefine hope um, through the knowledge that the struggle with suicidal thoughts and actions is, is valid and real. It's not selfish or weak. And it might happen again and again and again, but we can live through it with the right supports. Um, learn about the mental health and involuntary commitment laws in your state. Uh, learn about how it, it affects civil liberties. In Pennsylvania, if you're involuntarily hospitalized, you can never own a gun again. And I want nothing to do with a gun, but I will fight for my Second Amendment right because it's my damn right. Um, it just is, and that's unfair to have it taken away from me. Um, understand that this affects different cultures, different ways, black, brown, uh, indigenous people of color, queer people, 
it's all different. Um, and we should be looking at that. Think critically about the messaging we receive, like I talked about earlier. Um, demand better. Demand that we do better. Uh, fight for funding and policy change. Demand better research. Validate, appreciate, accept, celebrate your Black, Brown, Indigenous, Latinx, and other people of color in your life. Validate, accept, appreciate, and celebrate the fat and disabled people in your life. Believe victims. Donate to people with lived experience. If someone is doing work you love, support it. Um, are they struggling with bills? Help pay one. Do you know trans people? Use the pronouns they want you to use. Use their name that they want you to use. It doesn't matter if you don't like it. Is it going to hurt you? You know, that, that we have stats on. That saves lives. Using someone's name. Um, donate to their name change and gender marker change funds donate to their surgery funds throw them parties celebrate people um celebrate all, all the people but especially these people you know someone in a breakup support them buy them dinner be a safe adult for our kids um i had few safe adults in my life and i talked about that earlier too kids deserve our love and our care and our guidance even if they're not our own um use your skills to make someone's life better suicide prevention is all of these things it is subtle and it's explicit in therapy and meds and suicide prevention work, but it's all of these other things too. It's having food, it's having housing, a living wage, healthcare, it's supporting people who need help with sliding scale therapy fees, um, legal fees, bail, acknowledging the structural oppression, the white supremacy, and doing something about changing it, um, fighting for disability rights, for civil rights, for reproductive rights, for voting rights. Um, I don't care how you vote, but I think you gotta vote right now. Um, and you got to fight for other people's right to vote. When you are improving someone's quality of life, you are practicing suicide prevention. And that I think is just how it is. That's how I feel about it. And it's up to us. So we have to get to work. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for being here, Desiree. Um, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, there is a Q and A button. Um, you're welcome to lodge those in there and we can help facilitate those. Um, in the text or in the chat box, I'm going to drop the links um, to a uh, space for you to share what brings you hope as well as to provide feedback. Um, I wanted to say that um, I identify as a survivor of loss. Um, I am not an attempt survivor. And so for me as a suicidologist to understand and to contribute and to give back and to educate and to be the advocate that I am, I have to listen to people who have had the lived experience. And, um, and so I've, I've been through the live through this site and I've, I've watched the S word and I don't remember who said it, but someplace amongst um, all of that collateral, um, there is someone who said that, you know, when they're really struggling, when they're really feeling isolated and alone, you know, that they needed to be with something. And they said, just go adopt, a, go adopt a cat. Better yet, adopt a really old cat. And although I have, again, I've not been to the place um, where ending my life was an option, but I have felt isolated and alone. And I have gone and I've found that old cat. I adopted a 21-year-old cat to bring me joy. And so I look to those advocates who are sharing hopeful moments in their life. And I know that I can take those pieces and, and Im embody those in my own life. So Desiree, I do have one question. Um, and that would be, how do you suggest people go about dating therapists? What should they do as they start to try to navigate um, finding that good fit? We need Tinder for therapists. Um, <laughs> we do. So we do. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, more therapists have websites now, which is really nice, I think. Um, think about what it is that you want out of therapy um, and look for somebody who, you know, says that they specialize in that. So for me, it is, um, it's about self-injury, it's about suicide, it's about being able to talk about those things openly without fear that, um, that I might be hospitalized. Uh, it's about being able to talk about what, what it might take to be hospitalized and what a crisis looks like for me and what steps we're gonna take. Um, so I always ask people in advance, you know, what are, what are your views on this? How have you worked with suicidal people in the past? Um, you know, and, and, and what will we do if, um, if that happens, I also 
think it, I learned that it's really important for me to have a therapist who um, will share a small bit about themselves. Uh, I, I had a therapist for a few years recently who wouldn't share anything. And I, I don't want to be throwing my, my life story at a blank slate. It's hard when you don't have a person reflecting something back at you. So my, my new therapist is, um, I asked her, I was like, are you, will you disclose things about yourself if they're relevant? And she said, yeah. And so I know that she has a son and a husband and generally what neighborhood in Philly she lives in. And that um, likes good music. And that's all I really need to feel that, that human connection. But that's, impo that's an important piece to me. Um, I like to know about uh, their politics too, if I can. Um, so think about, think about that. You know, what, what do you value in a person who you're gonna tell everything to? How, how can you trust them and, and go there with them? Because if you can't trust them and you can't go deep with them, then no one's getting anything done really. Uh, so, so that, and, and that's not easy. <laughs> and there's a lot of privilege wrapped up in all the things I just said. I know that, um, you know, what if you're navigating an insurance website and it's just a list of names, that's hard, been there, done that, search the names. I think ZocDoc, uh, psychology today, see what you can find out about them. See what, um, what methods they use, what techniques they use. You know, if, if you're looking for DBT, because that's really skills-based, it's important to know who can do it. Uh, it's a specialized skill. Um, that sort of stuff. If you don't know, if, you, if they have something listed and you don't really know what it is, look it up. Like, we have to do homework and it's, it's frustrating, but asking those questions is, is really, I think, um, key to starting to have a good relationship with a therapist. And I also think if you can do it, it's really important to try and get a phone consult in advance of going and meeting them and, you know, possibly putting money down if they don't take insurance. Um, I kind of demand it at this point. I'm like, I'm not going to come in your office until I know more about you. So give me 15 minutes of your time. Yeah. And they do. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's worked out great for me, but it took me until I moved here five years ago. How old am I? It took me until I was 32 years old to know to do that. You know, it's just, it's, mm -hmm. It's so frustrating that we don't teach people how to advocate for themselves in, in any kind of like medical or, or medical related setting. Absolutely. I mean, we, we look for referrals when we're looking for an attorney or an accountant or a babysitter and a daycare center. Um, it's the same when it comes to our counselors. And it's great to have a counselor in your pocket and to see them mm -hmm. every six months if it's not an ongoing thing. Um, so that if an emergency comes up, if the DUI happens, if the, the divorce is on the table, that you have somebody to go to. And that that, you know, if it's somebody that you trust, that can be the person that, that you can um, share with others. So I know that we've gone over, but again, um, if you have any questions, drop them into the Q&A. These are ways that you can follow Desiree and stay involved and donate to her project. Hope, hope is that state of mind that believes and desires a positive outcome to situations in your life. It's that feeling uh, that things will turn out for the best. It's consistently looking forward to that positive outcome, something planned in our lives. Um, again, in the Tahoe area, we are standing up the Hope Squad program for uh, K-12 or um, for the middle schools and the high schools in the area, and we are looking for your hope. So, if you want to go to that link that's in the chat and share what brings you hope, um, everyone who participates will be entered into a drawing for some local gift certificates um, this month. And then we are looking for feedback. So, Mental Health in the Mountains feedback is at that second link. We would love to. Um, hear your your thoughts. So I don't see any other questions coming in. Desiree, I so appreciate your time today um, and all of the work that you've done for years and years and just your ability to share your story so authentically and um, purposefully. So thank, thank you. you for having me. And thanks yeah. everyone for listening to me for an extra lots of minutes. Awesome. Well, you've got babies upstairs, so we're going to let you go and um, we'll talk to you again soon. Take care. Thank you.